Testing, testing, test, test. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing.
Testing, testing. Good morning, Pilgrim Valley. Good morning, Pilgrim Valley. How's everyone doing this morning? What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. At this, at this time, I would ask that you stand as we open. This morning's scripture will be coming from the book of James, chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and had long patience, had long patience for it until he received the early and latter rains. I've read you James chapter 5, verse 7. May God add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his word. This time I would ask that you go into prayer with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father, just thanking you, Father. Father, we want to thank you for all the blessings we received, Father. Thank you for watching over us last night and waking us up this morning, Father. Thank you for being out for us, Father, protecting us, Father, guiding us and keeping us on that narrow path, Father. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, who died on the cross, Father, that through him we could have eternal life, Father. Thank you, Father, for being there, Father, when we didn't even know we were in the world, Father. Thank you, Father, for pulling us up out of those trenches and ditches that we dug for ourselves, Father. Thank you for having our back, Father. Father, we just want to ask you, Father, to be with us today, Father, as we go forth, Father. Father, we ask you to watch over the ones that are sick and shut in, Father, and the ones that had nowhere to lay their head at last night, Father, the ones that are lost, Father. Help us. Help them to bring them to you, Father, because, Father, we know, Father, that through you, Father, all things are possible, Father. Father, we just want to ask you to bless the Spirit of God, Father, and all the members and attendants that have showed up today, Father. Bless the ones that are here, Father, and the ones that are at home, Father, and watching on live stream, Father, and the ones that did not, Father, for whatever reason, Father. They are your children, too, Father. Christ, we just want to ask you to bless the baptism that we are about to perform today, Father. Father, we know, Father, that we have another one, Father, that we can take into the water. Father. Through your blessings, Father, we just want to thank you, Father. Father, bless the minister who's going to bring the word today, Father. Father, we ask you to bless our own Pastor Green, Father, who's not here now, Father, but we ask you to heal him, Father. Keep him strong, Father. Light his path, Father. Keep him, Father, with your loving arms wrapped around him, Father. Father, we ask you to bless the members of Pilgrim Valley, Father. Father, we just thank you for your guidance, Father, and your love, Father. Father, we ask you to forgive us for sins, trespasses, and wrongdoings that we have done, Father. Father, you said in your word, Father, that we have what to ask and we shall receive, Father. Well, Father, we're asking this morning, Father, Father, because we all have sinned and come short of the glory, Father. So we're asking, Father, for you to have mercy on us, Father. Your mercy endureth forever. Father, we just want to thank you. And in Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen.
depend on our works for salvation. Baptism is not a part of providing our salvation. Jesus Christ did all the work that's required for us to have eternal life. Baptism is what we do because we're saved, not to become saved. It's a way for us to identify with him and tell the world, see who I am now. See who I am now. You used to be. You do. Now I am a follower of Jesus
pray for her blessing, for her to have God's blessing. Thank God for change. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful change comes over you when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yes.
Pastor Green, but I'm here in his stead at his request. As he mentioned to us last week, he's been having some further difficulty with his knee and, and um, uh, is, is going to have to get off of it for again for a while. And uh, so uh, let's uh, continue to pray for him and the treatment for that and a swift healing. Well, I want to thank the choir for beautiful music this morning. If you have your Bibles with you and you want to follow along with the message this morning, it's going to come from the first chapter of the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 1. text will be 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you're wondering where Peter is in your Bible, if you turn to the back of the New Testament, come back about three books from Revelation and you'll find Peter. These verses read, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, 
Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Please be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, seeking his blessing in our time in the Lord's word this morning. I want to share some thoughts with you that come directly from, or at least touch directly on, verse 6 and a portion of it. The phrase that Peter chose, manifold temptations. And in this talk and in perhaps some subsequent ones, we're going to address how the Lord, through the Apostle Peter, helps believers in Peter's day and right now have God's might for our manifold temptations. God's made provision for us to deal with our manifold temptations temptations. And if you hadn't dealt with them, just keep living. Just keep living. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning and again we give thanks to you for your goodness. We thank you for allowing us to assemble together and to come to praise you and to learn of you through your word. We thank you, Lord, for the experience of witnessing a, a child of yours follow you in baptism. Lord, we just thank you for the testimony that it provides to all who are present and to the whole world that you are a loving Savior, that you are a God who redeems. You are a God who changes our lives from old to new, from dead to living. Father, we thank you for who you are and for all that you do for us. And we pray that in our time together in the remainder of this session this morning, Lord, that you will open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law, to understand more about what you've done for us and what you're able to do for us right this very day. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for forgiving us and washing us from all our unrighteousness. Bless us, O oh Lord, in this time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. First Peter chapter 1. Just like Peter said, I want to say to each of you, grace and peace. You can't wish anything better on anybody than for God's empowering grace, his unmerited favor. It can do more for you than any bank account, any retirement account, any lottery winnings, any other kind of, of uh, additional income that you might imagine, God's grace is able to supply everything. You see, material blessings can only do stuff for material things. But spiritual blessings can bless everything about you. It can even change your external appearance. Spiritual blessings can, can lighten your countenance. Some folks need makeup for that. But God, through his spirit, can so change the condition of your heart that even your smile will carry a greater communication of joy. 
and certainly peace. You can't buy it. You can buy some imitations for peace, but you can't buy real peace. You know, some folks, some folks when they numb their sense of their current circumstances, feel like they got a moment of peace. But numbing the pain, numbing the sensitivity, numbing the uh, awareness doesn't remove anything from your circumstance. But God's able to change your circumstance and he is able to change the inside of you with peace that the world can't copy. Today, and as the Lord permits, I believe we can benefit from the Apostle Peter's first epistle. It provides spiritual insights that are both timeless and timely, meaning they are eternal in their truth, but very, very present in their application. Peter's letter was not addressed to a specific church or just a single region, but to believers generally. And the general relevance of his thoughts wasn't just for people in the first century or the second or third. It's for us right now, 200 centuries later. We need this truth. We need this truth. 1 Peter 1. He says he's writing to these folks that are scattered abroad. And then verse 2, he says, what are, who are these people? And when he's describing these people, if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's talking about you too. You know, sometimes we forget what we look like. Have you ever, have you ever done that? You ever just stayed out of the mirror so long that you really kind of forgot what you look like? And you go back and you, you look in the mirror and you go, whoa. <laughs> I need some work. <laughs> and, and you realize just what you look like. But more important than knowing what you look like, it's more important to know who you are. Who are you? What do you have as a consequence of being a follower of Jesus Christ? He says, you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. In other words, God has done something to those who have come to Christ, recognizing that they are sinners, recognizing that their sins have separated them from God and put them in a position of condemnation, of being subject to condemnation. When you come face to face with the reality of your sin, you don't see clean. You don't see righteousness. You don't see good. You see something like what Elijah, uh, Elisha saw. Excuse me, uh, Isaiah saw. You see yourself as undone. You, you see yourself as unclean. And you wonder how it could be different. But then the realization comes from the truth of the word of God that you can't fix yourself. I saw a sad and unfortunate and unpleasant sight the other day going into work on 430 coming in on the freeway. A uh, truck had, had hit a deer and the deer was on the side of the road alive. The deer was, was seated. You could tell the limbs were mangled and the, the deer was severely injured and very unlikely to survive. The truck that had struck it was a uh, few hundred feet ahead on the side of the road and of course it's mid rush hour in the morning and cars are speeding by and I was able to get a glimpse as I approached and my heart kind of sunk at the thought and the doe you could just see the eyes just frozen uh, helpless the condition of the human soul in the because when we recognize where we are before a holy God, we are in the very same situation, broken, in a situation that we cannot repair, in a situation that is helpless without intervention. 
But praise be to the Lord, God did not leave us there. God chose to make provision for every single soul that comes into this world for their ability to be redeemed from the brokenness of sin. The provision's been made. God determined that he would save everyone that would repent of their sins and trust and believe in the salvation that Jesus provided when he paid for those sins on the cross and be given the same kind of everlasting life possessed by Christ because of his resurrection. Now everybody won't be saved. But it won't be because God didn't pay for it. Jesus paid it all and he paid it all for everyone. But some folks won't. Because they will never have had the experience or they never choose to have the experience. When the gospel is presented to them, when they're told about their condition, they won't admit, they won't acknowledge that they're in a helpless state. They think they can get back up on their crippled legs and make it. But the truth is, we can't. We can't. We have to have divine intervention. We have to have the miracle working love and grace of God. We have to have the provision of Christ's blood covering our sin. And that happens, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 10, that when one hears the gospel, one is able to repent and to believe the gospel and to trust the gospel. And based on faith in what Christ has done, God can wash away our sins, cause us to be born again. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You're not going to get there just by trying harder. You're not going to enter the kingdom of God by doing better than the next person. You're not going to be able to say, well, I'm doing better than they are, so I must be all right. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. God's not great in salvation on a curve. <laughs> salvation will be based on the righteousness of God, and only his righteousness will enter his kingdom. But praise God, he makes that righteousness available to us by grace through Christ, and God elected before the foundation of the world to save those who would believe in his son Jesus. And if you have believed, when Peter says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of to the blood of Jesus Christ, he's talking about you. If you're one of those. And that ought to bring joy to our hearts. And uh, thank you so much for the song, Changed. Yes, changed, changed, changed indeed. The Lord preserved Peter's letter as it was distributed to various churches, and we have the benefit of its wisdom now. The first thing Peter did was remind those recipients how special they are in the eyes of the Lord. I know some of you may not be feeling real special today, we have those moments. That's all right. That's part of living. Life's not always going to be big smiles and giggles and laughs. There are hard times. There are grievous moments. But through all of that, God supplies what we need. And when our adversities come and our insecurities come, God's there for that too. And that's what Peter's writing to these folks about. And that's what Peter's writing to you and I about. There's a common phrase in English. Uh, most of you have probably heard it. How many of you heard the phrase, taken for granted? We've heard that phrase before. The modern meaning of the idiom is that we treat something possessed, that something that one has, as so certain that we do not sufficiently value its possession nor do we perceive the high cost of its loss. Sometimes people want to take for granted the things that we have in the Lord. Don't. Don't take them for granted. 
They have been. Salvation we can't take for granted because it has been. But what God has given us to live successful spiritual lives, we have to access. We have to apply. Pastor Green gave us a series of very valuable lessons on the whole armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6 and the importance of taking up that entire suit of armor, including prayer, if we're going to succeed as believers for the Lord. Well, Peter tells us some more about what it takes to live and com and completely fulfill our obligations in service to the Lord. And these are things that we can't take for granted. These are things that we have to address and do. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. No day ought to pass without our taking the time to thank and praise God for what he's done. There's a song I love to listen to called Bloodstained uh, Pages. And uh, uh, this wonderful song, one verse of the song says, Whenever I stand before my maker and the book is open wide and the deeds of men, both good and bad, are recorded there inside, there won't be a sinful way beside my name or a time I let him down for the crimson blood of Jesus kept my wrongs from being found. Oh, the pages have been stained by the blood he shed for me. Praise God. I can't read them. Neither can he. What's been forgiven is forgotten and impossible to see. Bloodstained pages, stained by blood, he shed for me. We need to keep that fresh in our heart, that that's who we are before the Lord. But you know, we, we need to keep these truths fresh on our thoughts. Verse 4 builds on it, to inheritance. What did God provide for us? to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for me. If any of you have a safe deposit box at a bank, you've got something that's been put there, maybe somebody else put it to you and gave you the key. We have reserved for us, by God, a future that we cannot lose, a future that is certain and definite in a kingdom of righteousness. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, what we have in Christ, unlike property, is not going to be rusty. It's not going to decay. It's not going to be lost. I know when my wife, we've been, we've been married 41 years, and her mother made her wedding dress, beautiful white wedding dress, and uh, uh, we put it in a bag and and... We were going to keep it and have it long-lasting. And I don't know, it seems like it was about our silver anniversary or so, about 25 years later, pulled it out. <laughs> no, wasn't going to be wearing that anymore. Uh, it was done for. But that's not what we have in Christ. The Lord has given us eternal life and we'll never perish and nobody can take it away. Jesus put it like this in John 10 and 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish because we're kept by the power of God. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. That means I'm in Christ and I'm in the Father and nobody's taking me out. The devil can make up his mind, I'm just going to take him out, but it won't work. It won't work. The only thing that can defeat the successful spiritual life of a believer in Christ is the believer's surrender. Even then, they won't lose their soul, but they will lose the joy and the privilege of living a life honoring to the one who saved them. 
And if somebody has given everything for you and delivered you from a certain death, surely, surely you wouldn't just throw it down. Surely you wouldn't just step on it and treat it as the Hebrew writer described as doing despite unto the grace of God, despite unto the name of Christ, and putting him to an open shame. Surely we would not do that to the one who loves us enough to have given the life of his only begotten son. But then we come to verse 6. Verse 6 is the focus of our thoughts to bring to mind what we're going to be focusing on. He says, wherein ye greatly rejoice. What are we rejoicing about? We're rejoicing about the eternal life we have. We're rejoicing about its incorruptibility. We're re rejoicing about the fact that we are destined for a place present with our Savior. But, <laughs> but the seasons change where we live right now. And we can have our seasons of gladness and joy and singing. But sometimes we get see seasons where our song changes from a song of gladness to a song of sadness. A, from a song of mirth to a, a song of grief. And it's in those times that we have the opportunity to discover and to learn that we not only have been given eternal life, we have been given a mighty and powerful temporal life that we can live through the power of God. The same power that reserves our souls in heaven forever. God wants us to be victorious in living this life despite the changes in the season and despite what Peter describes here where he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness. Because sometimes those days are going to come. Sometimes those days are going to come. And it's not going to just be because you forgot your keys or left your phone in the bathroom at a public place. It's not going to be just because you forgot some small item. It's not going to be because somebody didn't greet you in the way that you wanted to be greeted. It's the heaviness that comes from the loss of someone you love deeply. The heaviness that comes from rejection of someone. The loss and the heaviness that comes when you get news that just shakes you about your economic security and stability. The heaviness that comes when somebody who is in a position to do so makes up in their mind that they're going to make your life a living hell. And there are folks who have positions like that in our lives. And sometimes they get used by the enemy to pursue just that end. It's in those times that God wants us to know because he wrote it through his apostle Peter. He wants us to know that even in those times, God has what we need to get us through what he calls the season of heaviness through in these manifold temptations. Now you might wonder, what does that phrase mean? The phrase manifold means multiple of different kinds. So manifold means it's not just one kind of temptation. You're going to have a lot of temptations, but not just a lot of temptations. You're going to have them in a number of different kinds of temptation. We all have things that we're real good at, our talent and the skills we've learned. But most of us have areas that we're just not as well versed. We have things we did real good in in school, and then there was other things that we didn't do so well in. 
We had things that we were able to specialize in and do, and then there are things that we're not so great at. And our enemy wants to find the things where we're a little weak. He wants to find those areas in our lives where we don't have as much confidence, and he wants to come at us in those areas. Not to say that he doesn't want to knock you down in your strength, too. He'd love to do that, but he's cheap. He doesn't want to spend that much. The devil's like the thief that comes to your house and sees the alarm sign in the yard and say, well, <laughs> I guess I'll leave that one alone. He'll move on. But if he comes by and he sees the door's been left open, he sees the window up, he sees a possibility. And sometimes through the moments of heaviness, those seasons of heaviness, that's when you really need to beware of the manifold temptations that can be brought to bear to cause your life to struggle, to cause your life to become where you find yourself in Job's situation, where his wife came to him. And it may not be a wife, may not be a husband, may be a best friend, might be your own thoughts to just come to you and say, just curse God and die. Just quit. Just quit pretending. You know, the devil will tell you that you're pretending to be a Christian. But you should remember, you've been redeemed from sin. You've been made new. You are a person who experienced the weight of the guilt of your sins. You felt condemned, but you also felt the joy of the relief of that. Your salvation is real. It's not make-believe. As Peter wrote in his second epistle, he says, we've not made known the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to you as some cunningly devised fable. But we were eyewitnesses of his glory. Peter stood with Christ on the mount of what's called transfiguration, and he saw Christ's face literally changed before him in glory as he stood next to prophets of old. He heard the voice of God the Father speak from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the same man, though, that on the night of Christ's arrest, he's aside a watching things at a distance, and somebody walks up to him and sees him in the crowd and say, hey, that's, you're one of his, aren't you? And Peter said, no, no, it's, it's not me. Twice more he did in fulfillment of, God's, of Christ's prophecy to him that he would deny him thrice before the cock crowed twice. Yet Peter was able to come back from the low moment of, I'm sure, the low moment when, the, when he heard the cock crow, the, I'm sure he felt lower than he could possibly fall. He would have been tempted to follow Judas outside of town and hang himself. But Peter didn't because Peter had a real salvation. Peter had a real salvation that changed him on the inside. And though he himself had fallen, God's spirit was still working on him. And God brought him back from that weak moment to tell us these words about how to deal in our weak moments with the manifold temptations that will come against us. Peter warns us to expect seasons where, despite being sincere in our faith, we will nonetheless go through heaviness. The word heaviness speaks of distress, grief, or sadness. But God supplies what we need through those times. Where are these manifold temptations? We won't have time to go through in much detail this morning. I'm basically setting up some thoughts to come. But know this. You're going to be tempted in a number of areas. They're not all the same. You're going to have spiritual temptations. Those are the ones that we think of. Temptations to commit sin based on our lust. 
the desire for power, money, illicit relationships, those are that area of spiritual temptation. But there's also a spiritual temptation that comes from fear. A spiritual temptation that will push us towards timidity and, a, and an unwillingness to be bold for truth. An unwillingness to stand for truth. A, a timidity that will, would cause us to shy away from standing for the things that we know are correct. There's a spiritual area of temptation of pride that will cause us to be hypocrites. We're willing to tell everybody else what they ought to do, but we don't do what we, want, what we ought to do. We compare ourselves with others and build ourselves up based on our perceived superiority to someone else. Get caught up in vanity. Be like the, the Pharisees in their day who loved to pray in public. Love to be seen giving. But inside, we're completely at odds with God. We can be tempted to those things. Pride, fear, lust. But then there's physical temptations as well. Satan couldn't succeed at all with, with tempting Christ, either spiritually or physically. He found Christ after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And he came to Christ and he said, hey, ain't you, you hungry, ain't you? <laughs> How, you want something to eat? He says, well, why don't you just turn that rock into some food? You can do it. Well, he tried to take advantage of Jesus' physical weakness at the moment. The devil will do the same for you in the physical areas of your life. He will try to make you a captive to habits. He'll try to make you a, habit, a, a, a captive to tastes of various kinds. Bring you into captivity and cause you to have something dangled in front of you like bait and lead you around to a place of destruction and defeat and disappointment to God. He'll take advantage of your fatigue, of your pain, of your disease. To combine the physical temptation with the spiritual temptation in another area. He won't just shoot overhead, he'll attack at a different direction at the same time. He will try to surround you, he will try to flank you. I know Brother Oliver, military man, he knows how, you know, one of the most important things in a battle circumstance where you're facing an enemy. Your, whoever's leading you is going to say, fellas, we can't get flanked. <laughs> and what that means is, let's keep them out there. Don't let them get around us. If we, they end up getting around us, we're done for. The enemy wants to flank you. He wants to get around you in every way he can, and the manifold temptations will come at you. Not only spiritually, not only physically, but mentally. He will come at you with frustration and disappointment, with misperceptions about things, and get you thinking in circles about lies. He will get you wrapped up in thinking about what you think somebody else might be thinking. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be funny. That's just true. I've talked to people who who themselves find themselves in a struggle because of their fear and their concern about what somebody else might be thinking. And it's unfortunate that we ever, as believers, let ourselves get in a position where we're more concerned about what someone else might be thinking than what God already knows about us. God knows everything about us. He knows what's wrong with us. That the key to us is not worrying about what somebody else might be thinking, but worry about what we can do to do what God knows and has told us to do. To be right with him, and then we don't need to worry about other people's thoughts. He'll come at you with adversarial temptations. And what I mean by that is, in Peter's day and throughout the world now, we're fortunate we don't, by and large, live with this where we live right now. But in many parts of the world, 
governments and, and private organizations have made it their mission to destroy those who believe in Jesus Christ. Persecution is just not our daily experience. But it was for the people in Peter's day, and, and, and we'll see Peter talked about it. Peter himself, the Jews came after him, uh, the uh, religious leaders, the Pharisees of that day, came after him in opposition, locked him up in jail, and said, quit preaching in that man's name. Just stop. And they just had to tell him, who do you think we should obey? You or God? We're going to obey God. And so we should, we are warned to anticipate adversarial temptations where they're in testing. Temptation is broader than merely enticement. It also speaks of a type of testing that happens where one is tested to the sense of the strength, to see just how much you can stand. And temptations will come in our lives that will do that, and we need to be prepared. And so Peter warns us. It can come from government, and it can come from personal enemies, but they will, they will come nonetheless, but we're more than conquerors. What can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. That's the one single word. You can go to Romans 8, the last few verses of that chapter, and read the, the list of all of the things that can't do it, but the summation of it is nothing. Nothing. And so we... When these various manifold temptations come towards us, God wants us to know we have everything in Christ that we need to succeed against them. And as I wrap up with the last couple of verses, as I close these thoughts, one of the things to keep in mind is the reason the manifold temptations come in the first place. We need to keep that in our minds, in our understanding so that we don't lose faith, that we don't lose hope. He says, these, he says, you may be in heaviness through manifold temptation. He says, I'm telling you this, that the trial of your faith, that's what happens when you come under the influence of manifold temptations. Your faith is being tried. Your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, the manifold temptations are coming. The enemy's got his purpose for what they are going to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But God's got a different plan. God's got a different plan. The enemy's lined up. He's ready. Let's take him. And the Lord's got a plan as well. He says, come on. You're going to, I'm going to use what you're using against my people to make them stronger than you can ever imagine. I'm going to use what you bring against them to make them better. And it's going to redound to my glory and their joy. This life may bring many forms of testing and trial, but in the eternal scheme of things, it's just for a moment. He says, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, that we might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you, Christian, if you endure, as Paul said when he wrote to Timothy, he says, Timothy, you need to learn how to endure hardness as a good soldier. Why? Because we're in a war. You don't need armor if you're not in combat. But we need it because we are in a fight. And to go through this life not believing that, not understanding that, we are robbing ourselves of the blessing of being able to bring glory to Christ through the victories God can bring through us through our faith in him. He says, 
I love how Peter, how Paul put this in 2 Corinthians 4 and 15. He says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, meaning they're just here for a little while, like our lives, as James says, just vapors that appears for a little while and vanishes away. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And so Peter closes, or I close with Peter's completing the sentence in verses 8 and 9. He says, Whom having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Yes, you're going through it. Yes, you will go through it if you're not now. But you can go through it with joy that can't be described. You can go through it full of God's glory, with a shine on you that people just wonder, you know, he didn't buy that at the store. I don't think she got that at the beauty parlor. Sister, tell me, how are you doing this in this time? And you can tell them what your God is doing. You can tell them what your God has done for you. You can tell them how through your manifold temptations, through your heaviness, the goodness, the grace, the love of God is there to help you defeat the lust that come against you, the pride that wants to rise up in you, the fear that so often wants to come upon you and cause you to cower. God's not given us that. He's given us the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And these are available to us, but we have to trust him, and we have to go his way. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Because one day, one day, as the old song says, one day, I want to be in the number when the saints come marching home. Don't you want to be there? I mean, don't you want to be a part of that? I mean, when the saints line up, here they come. Don't you want to be in the number when the saints come marching home? Not in shame, not in regret, but in gladness and joy, rejoicing at the victories God brought through you, through his own power. Let's stand. May the Lord bless you today. May his word bless Speak to the needs in your life, circumstances that you face. Let you know that you may be in hardship, you may be in adversity, but nothing greater than God, nothing greater than his love, nothing greater than his power, nothing greater than his ability to bring you through. The Lord's worth our faithfulness. He's worth every bit of all we have least for the little while we have on this earth. Y'all, we, we look at our lives and we think we are here for a long time, but mm -mm. David said, what is your life? It's a, it's a hand breath. About that long. If that. It's not long at all. And we'll see in next chapter in, in Peter. Peter talks about where we're like all flesh is grass. All of it. But there's something that's going to last. And God's given that to us. Where are you today? If you need prayer today, you need God to bless you in your life to overcome. You need wisdom for handling the manifold temptations in your life. You need strength for standing up to all of those adversities. Maybe you're struggling with pain from disease. Maybe you're struggling with the pain of a broken relationship. Maybe you're dealing with the uncertainty of economics. 
Maybe you're dealing with fear of past regrets. God's greater than all of it. If there's sin, he can forgive it. If there's an enemy, he can defeat it. He can help you in this, in this time, in this moment. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've already lost. You're not even in the elect. You can be, though. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's made the decision to save the believer, but you've got to decide to believe. Will you turn from sin and turn to Christ? He's extending his arms to you to come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you'll find rest unto your souls. Come, if the Lord is called. We can visit and find out about your circumstance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for our altar call prayer. You can pray to the Lord where you are for your salvation. You can pray to him for what the needs are in your life. But don't not use, don't waste this moment to have a conversation with God. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we are grateful to be assembled. You described your church, you described your place of worship as a house of prayer. Lord, we want the assembly of the believers of Pilgrim Valley to be a place of your presence, a place where prayers are offered in sincerity and in truth, a place where prayers go up for praise to you and for blessings to your people. For the sharing of the good news to the lost. Lord, we pray right now for a work of your spirit in every heart that's here before you. Lord, touch us. Help us to, to see properly from your word. To understand who you are and all that you are trying to do for us in the brief time we have remaining on this planet. Oh, Lord, give us your strength. Give us your wisdom. Give us your guidance. Give us fellowship one with another. If we can do those things that edify one another and not hurt, not damage. If we can do those things, Lord, that will build a place that honors and glorifies your name. Not because of its beauty, but because of its love. Oh, Lord, do your work in us this day. Whatever that need might be, Lord. If there's somebody here that doesn't know you, Lord, by your spirit, tell them that they are apart. Show them, Lord, they are lost in the woods. Show them, Lord, they're broken and hurt irreparably on the side of the road. Requiring your divine intervention. Touch them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. for the deacons if you'd come for the officers for this morning's offering when you think about what God's done for you don't you want to show him appreciation don't you want to let him know Father I thank you thank you this opportunity to give is an opportunity to express to the Lord your gratitude for all he's done for you and to provide for the operation of this facility and the carrying out of its ministries for the blessing of our community. If the Lord puts on your heart to give, move in response to him. Nothing else matters. Don't move because you want to show somebody else something. Move because you want to honor the Lord. He'll receive it. He'll magnify it. He'll bless it. 
and it'll be plenty for all he wants to do. Again, it's a blessing to see you this morning. God's blessings be upon each of you. I want to take our benediction for also from 1 Peter. At the end of Peter's letter in the fifth chapter, Peter gives a powerful benediction that I think will be a blessing to you and I as well. Let's see, this coming weekend, is that the uh, women's... Uh, study starting this coming week November the 5th coming up Saturday so please keep that in mind and on your calendars 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10 and 11 Peter says this please stand says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us all say, Amen. Amen.